All right. That's good. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Sally Caldwell at Trojan Memorial Library in East Berlin. We're a branch of Adams County Library System. With me here tonight is Ashia Mills um, of Walking Shadow Ecology Tours of Yellowstone and uh, Jess Laganowski, branch uh, director here at Trone. And Ryan Huffman is also here. Um, we're delighted that you've joined us for this amazing program. Tonight's virtual tour of our first national park, Yellowstone, is part of our Adams County Reads One Book program. Um, each October, we read one book title across the county and schedule fun programs uh, around the themes of the book. And this year's book is Leave Only Footprints by Connor Knighton. So before we get started, this is uh, a webinar and this is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it back on our YouTube channel. We encourage you to um, type any questions that you have in the chat box. Ashia won't be taking any questions until the end of the uh, presentation, which will be just under an hour or so. Um, so finally, I'm very excited to introduce tonight's presenter, Ashia Mills. She is the owner of Walking Shadows Ecology Tours of Yellowstone. She lives near the north entrance, if I'm right, of Yellowstone um, in Gardner with her husband, an ecologist, and her daughter. And she has spent half her life exploring and sharing Yellowstone, helping connect people to a wild landscape and to themselves. And I will let you take it from here, Ashia. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you all so much. Um, this is a, a genuine honor for me to be here. Um, for one thing, because I am a huge fan and proponent of public libraries, and I appreciate everyone who's engaged with your public library, um, and also your interest in Yellowstone National Park, or national parks, federal lands, public lands on the whole. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hope that this all pops up like it should. Um, and uh, Sally or Jess or anyone just interrupt me if um, things are not going, um, if, if something gets weird for you. Um, let's see, we don't want that. We want to start our slideshow from the beginning. Let's see if that works. Um, and so like Sally said, I've lived in Yellowstone for uh, going on 30 years, and I have been, um, let's see, your screen share is paused, okay, it even doesn't matter how many, it's always a little miraculous to me that we manage to um, connect this way, so give me just a second here and hope that it pops up the right way now, I don't know why it's not, slideshow, resume slideshow, let's try this one, okay, how's that looking from your end, Sally? Looks great. Okay, very good. Um, and so like she said, I love questions. Um, I do have a ton of slides that I wanna get through. So if you can jot them down or throw them in the chat box and um, we're gonna have some help kind of managing those towards the end. Um, but I, I do love questions. Yellowstone is huge and old. It is the world's first national park. And I am honored to be able to take you on a bit of a virtual journey um, through the park. So bear with me here for these first few slides um, because I wanna kind of set us in place. Um, and so just for a sense of scale and where we are in the world, um, we are in the Northern Rockies and you can see that orange box, that's Yellowstone Park proper, all 3,500 square miles, surrounded by the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So the areas surrounding the park, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but what I want to show you on this map is not just where we are on the continent, but particularly the fact that Yellowstone is home to some of the most important waterways in the world. So many people across the continent are connected to our snowpack, whether you're in the heartland, uh, over across the Missouri drainage, um, two of the three forks of the Missouri start inside of Yellowstone. The Snake River comes out of our south boundary. That's the major tributary to the Columbia. So anyone who's spent time in the Pacific Northwest, salmon issues, tribal issues, that's our snowpack. And then the Green River starts just south of the park and that's 70% of the Colorado River drainage. So anyone who's paying attention to water issues in the West and the Southwest in particular, the Colorado is kind of a poster child. That again is the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystems snowpack. So a really important uh, 
place in terms of water. Now let's zoom in on that green kind of scribbly box and we're looking at the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So the park itself is huge um, and hopefully some of you've had a chance to be here in person. If not, put it on your list. Um, but we're surrounded by other federal and private and state and tribal lands. And altogether, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem makes uh, about 19 million acres, roughly the size of Maine. So it's an enormous uh, stretch of land. In fact, we consider it the most intact ecosystem in the temperate world. Uh, basically all of the large mammals that we would have started out with in pre-colonial times. So let's zoom in again on Yellowstone Park proper. This is the map they give you when you come in the gate. Um, and so you can see our five entrances um, from the south, the east, the northeast, the north, and the west entrance over in West Yellowstone. The north entrance is where I live. You can see that little town, it says Gardner. There's a tent right above it. There's some campgrounds nearby. Um, some of you have been aware of the flooding that we experienced this year. Um, and that basically washed out the main road between Gardner and Mammoth. So we've been using a temporary road this year and that's been really um, exciting and interesting and uh, very limited access guides are one of the few groups that can get in and out, but only on uh, very limited time windows. Uh, but you can see some specs there. Um, most of the park is in Wyoming, um, but three of the five entrances are in Montana. So that's a big claim to fame, just a tiny little corner in the state of Idaho. Um, but a tremendous amount of uh, mammals, birds, amphibians, and um, uh, lots of, of fauna as well. The main thing I want you to see on this map, I took the liberty of highlighting it in a Sharpie, is that sort of amorphous circle. That is the bowl of one of the largest volcanoes on Earth. That is the Yellowstone caldera. So if you could see that dimensionally, it would be a big bowl, and that is one of the largest volcanic systems on the planet. So we're gonna take this map and flip it upright here on our next slide. So that green boundary on the last slide, you can see kind of that rough uh, jaggedy Eastern edge. Um, and then uh, rem remember the shape of that, that roughly rectangular shape, but how jaggedy that Eastern edge is. I'll explain that here in a second. Um, now take a look at this and we're gonna see a different angle and hopefully that box will disappear here in a second. Um, the green box is Yellowstone. The blue lines are the state lines. So Wyoming to the South East, Idaho, and then Montana up North. The red circle is our caldera. Look what our scientists think is below us. Um, for most of you, if you're on planet Earth, look outside your window right now. If you were to start digging down through that crust, you would have to go maybe 50 miles or so, about 80 kilometers before you get to any kind of molten material. Here in Yellowstone, we are within a couple of miles of, um, of that, uh, that magma body. Now it might not be a, a, a lake of fire, it might be some harder rock with little pockets of magma in it, but regardless, Yellowstone is a couple thousand feet higher than it should be because of that magma plume pushing us up. Um, I like to use the um, egg, like a hard boiled egg analogy. Um, so if you picture an egg, just a regular old chicken egg you're gonna have for breakfast and that real thin shell, that's kind of like the crust of the earth. Most of the planet is made up of the mantle or in our egg analogy, the egg white down to the core um, or the egg yolk. So just remember that and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so we are going to take a journey here. Um, we're going to jump on our trusty steed. That's our tour vehicle, Walking Shadow Ecology, like Sally mentioned. That's my very small educational tour company. And if you're ever in the neighborhood or have friends headed our way, we'd love to see you. And we're going to actually pop into the Grand Teton National Park, because if you're in the neighborhood, you ought to go see the Tetons. They are an impressive mountain range. It is a separate entity, another federal national park, but some of the tallest relief mountains in the world. So we're going to actually start our journey down on the south end of Yellowstone. Um, I'm going to flip back to that map here real quick. Um, take a look at there's basically a figure eight road system. So we're going to start down there at the south boundary. We're going to move north along the shore of Yellowstone Lake. Take a quick run out the east access road. Continue on north. Um, we'll make our way over to Old Faithful and then eventually up to the Mammoth Hot Springs area, Gardner, Montana, and then over to the Northeast entrance. So here at the South Boundary, we're overlooking the origins of the Snake River, again, the largest tributary to the Columbia River coming off the Western side of the Continental Divide. 
And as we're moving north, um, this is a lot of what Yellowstone looks like. It's not the big drama that's to our south with the Grand Tetons or up north in Montana, like Glacier National Park, because we are full of lava flows. So that bowl is not as deep as it once was. The last time the big volcanic eruption occurred was about 631,000 years ago, give or take a, a few days. And after that last eruption, lava filled in the bowl. So it's not as deep as it once was. And you can see here in the Lewis River Canyon, a tributary to the snake, um, you can notice the, the fact that we have just sort of these rolling timbered hills and lava flows, mostly rhyolite lava flows. And um, along the junction of that caldera boundary, often we find waterfalls, hundreds of waterfalls across Yellowstone National Park where two different types or ages of rock, one is gonna be weaker and creates these, these uh, cascades. And a lot of Yellowstone looks like this. Um, sometime recently, some of you may have seen a meme floating around on social media that said, there's too many trees, there's nothing but trees. Uh, those are clouds, not mountains there in the distance. But this is a lot of what Yellowstone looks like about 80% of the plateau is forested. Um, so it's not um, uh, a lot of big mountain views, particularly once you are in the caldera itself in that volcanic boundary. You do cross the Continental Divide. It kind of cuts off the Southwest corner of the park. Most of Yellowstone's water drains to the Atlantic Ocean, like you saw in that earlier map. Uh, but even when you're on the Continental Divide, you know, you think of the, the spine of the continent and really it's it's just rolling timbered hills, nothing, uh, nothing terribly exciting. But high altitude, we're up around average about 8,000 feet on the road system. Uh, the lowest elevation in Yellowstone is just above 5,000 feet. The highest is uh, 11,358 feet. So it does range uh, quite a bit topographically. And here we find ourselves on the shore of Yellowstone Lake. And we're the, gonna see the first of our thermal features. And I love the name of the book that we've read this month about um, Leave Only Footprints. Unfortunately, I haven't read it. It's been on a wait list for my library um, and it has not come in in enough time. But um, Leave uh, Only Footprints refers to some of those leave no trace ethics. And um, we've changed our minds a lot on what national parks are and how we manage them and what we do in them. So you can see that old historic photograph. Um, the fishing cone is a hot spring. And back in the old days, they used to catch a trout in Yellowstone Lake, turn around and cook it in the hot spring. Um, we don't do those things anymore for one thing because we understand how fragile these features are, but also we've found things like arsenic and mercury and <laughs> such that you don't really probably want to ingest too much of. Um, take a look out there in the distance. This is in the spring, um, still a little bit of snowpack out there. And you can see that ridge line. That's that Eastern boundary line. Remember I showed you how jaggedy that Eastern boundary line is. And that's, that's why it basically follows the tops of those mountains. Um, because it's spring, the water level in Yellowstone Lake is quite a bit higher. So you can see from that historic photograph that would have been later in the season when you have a little more exposure. Um, the West Thumb Geyser Basin, where we found ourselves, is evidence of that giant volcano. Um, another food analogy is uh, an apple pie before you put it in the oven, you have to do something, or a baked potato. It's probably the more modern day analogy before you put it in the microwave, you have to poke holes in it right? You have to pierce the skin or the crust, otherwise it blows up, makes a big mess. We have four coals in Yellowstone helping to release some of that heat and pressure from our magma plume, and that's what we're seeing here. A hot spring, um, generally hot water coming up from underneath, pooling at the surface and spilling out, and we'll talk a little bit more about these colors down the road and some of the dynamic nature of our features. The incongruously named Black pool um, was black or darker, at least when they named it. And like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about these colors, but West Sun Geyser Basin is one of my favorites among many um, because it is right there on the shore of Yellowstone Lake. So continuing north, Yellowstone Lake is enormous. It's kind of a surprise to find it. Um, we call it the largest alpine lake in North America. Lake Tahoe is technically a little bit bigger, but it's a little bit lower but about 141 miles of shoreline. If you were to walk out the car right here and traverse the entire shoreline, um, look right in the center of the mountains, kind of the bottom center of your screen, there's a flat top mountain 
we're going to go take a, a quick jog up Avalanche Peak in a little while. Um, but an extraordinary scene, uh, idyllic, quiet, peaceful. If you were to drain out Yellowstone Lake, you'd probably have the largest geyser basin on earth under the water. But it does freeze over every year. Um, this is right at the beginning of our uh, breakup, about six months of the year, Yellowstone Lake, that enormous area covered with ice. Our first glimpse of the Lake Yellowstone Hotel, which is uh, very different from a lot of the lodges in Yellowstone. Mostly they're sort of more rustic style. Um, the Lake Yellowstone Hotel used to be uh, an old kind of boring clapboard railroad structure. All of our early hotels were built by the railroad, which had a lot of pressure to actually create the park on the whole. Um, the railroad companies wanted a destination as they were building the Transcontinental Railroad. And in fact, the first senator uh, who introduced the bill into Congress way back in 1871, um, it was signed into, into being in 1872, was a railroad guy um, from Iowa. So uh, about 1903, a fellow by the name of Robert Reamer, we'll, we'll visit him again down the road, got his hands on the Lake Yellowstone Hotel and turned it into this grand lady of the lake. Uh, this is one of the finer uh, establishments in the park. You, you can listen to the string quartet of an evening. Um, they're there for about six weeks out of the summer. And rooms here are pricey. Um, these are probably the highest prices in the park. Um, you can get a a room for five or $600, cabins for about half that, um, all the way up to if you want to treat yourself to the suite. Um, but it's a, a lovely place to sit, have an evening uh, adult drink, and listen to the quartet. Um, and now we're going to shoot out east across the fishing bridge. Um, again, somewhat incongruously named now, this is what it looks like these days. Um, but this is what it looked like for most of the early park history. Again, with our leave no trace ethics, um, we do still allow fishing, but what we discovered was that the largest um, nest, uh, uh, gra uh, spawning grounds for our native cutthroat trout was right below this bridge. And so you'll see historic photographs of people with like 30, 50 fish on a line. Um, we don't allow that kind of fishing anymore. Most of it is catch and release outside of an exotic that was introduced um, back in the 90s, unfortunately, that has done a number on our native cutthroat trout, the uh, non-native Mackinac or lake trout. Um, so one of the most important things about Yellowstone and about national parks is that as much as possible, we're just trying to let the natural process take place. We're trying not to take things out or put things into the ecosystem. And that does include things like exotic weeds, invasive weeds, or other types of species. Um, so you would not see this scene these days, fortunately. Um, turning around behind and looking out, um, there's about 156 inlet streams into Yellowstone Lake and only one way out, and that is the Yellowstone River. So we're going to follow the river a little bit later. But first, let's head out for a short walk. We're going to go for a short walk out to Storm Point. And any time that we take a step off of or out of our vehicles, we are in bear country. Um, again, with our leave no trace ethics, planning ahead and being prepared, knowing your route, knowing the weather, um, Storm Point is called Storm Point for a reason, um, being aware of being in grizzly country um, anywhere that you go in the ecosystem. And so there's a couple of rules. One is just always being on the lookout. The number one rule in bear country is make noise. If they hear us coming, generally they're going to get out of our way. I have had some bear encounters. It's always been my fault when I'm not paying attention and not making enough noise. I do carry bear spray. Uh, never had to use it. Uh, my husband did once. That was a, kind of an exciting story. And they do say to travel in groups of three or more. There's never been an attack on a group of three or more. Um, but today it might just be us that wanders out. Um, and we do see some sign of bear on um, this grizzly scratch on the left hand side that's my daughter's hand from a few years ago um, has been there for years as long as I've been paying attention so at least probably 20 years that that scratch has been there but um, you'll notice that on the trees. Um, it sharpens their claws just like your cat scratching on the back of the couch. Um, also scent marking that's another way that that bears will um, let other bears know about their territory. A little bit of bear scat in the trail, um, probably a black bear judging by the size. Um, and this was in the fall. So we're seeing a lot of vegetation. Um, about 80% of our bear's diet is 
grass or, or flowers, different types of vegetation. They get their protein when they can. Uh, but this little bear was literally just like, would kind of do this army crawl forward and eat out another patch of grass in the spring. And uh, here's a short video talking about the difference between black bears and grizzly bears. This is again, a few years ago with my daughter, a giant grizzly early in the season, just out of hibernation, feeding on a Did winter killed like carcass. Uh, both of them kind of like water. There's a yellow headed blackbird there in the foreground. Oh, that's beautiful. Can you see him with your eyes right now? The big difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear is that a grizzly bear has a hump yeah. on his shoulders. Oh. Look at those claws. That's how you can tell the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear. If the hump... Oh, he's pooping! <laughs> can you see him pooping? Yeah. So one of the best-selling books in the park, if you have kids in your life, who Pooped in the Park. Really good book on ecology tracking for younger folks or some of us that are older. Um, but another field marker besides that big hump are those big long claws. Um, all the better not to rub your face off, but for digging. So grizzly bears will dig and dig for roots and tubers, maybe a ground squirrel uh, nesting, uh, something like that. Black bear claws are a little more hooked and better for climbing. We do have both species. This is a black bear, probably a boar or a male, judging on the size. Um, and not all of our black bears are black. In fact, this is a, a, a black bear that's a cinnamon colored black bear, but you can see the rump is higher than the hump. So again, that's the main field marker. You want to avoid running into either one. Um, we do have, this is a sow black bear with a, a cinnamon cub, so they can mix and match, depends on who dad was. Um, but it is critically important to know that you're in bear country. Um, it's such a privilege to live with bears. Um, and this is, of course, the most dangerous kind of mom. Um, you don't want to get between them and their babies. You don't want to get between them and their food. And you don't want to surprise them. So just make noise and they are incredibly fun to have around. Um, so we're gonna go on a, a short walk, just about a two and a half mile hike out here to Storm Point. Yellowstone is so full of dynamic wonders, geysers and wolves and, and hot springs and mud pots and huge mountains. Um, that's Avalanche Peak coming into view. We're gonna take a quick run up there. But Yellowstone also affords us some time to just take a breath, calmly sit on the edge of a creek or a meadow and reconnect with those most elemental parts of ourselves in this big wide open space. It's the Grand Tetons to the south, just over the ridge line there. Let's go follow those hikers as we traverse the trail back into the woods. I'm taking a second to look at uh, our lodgepole pines. I mentioned about 80% of Yellowstone is forested. About 80% of those trees are a single species, these tall stately lodgepole pines. And then let's take a quick run up a mountain because that's one of the reasons why I stayed in Yellowstone. The, uh, the power of being up in these high spaces and looking around and getting these novel views that's looking down the road back towards Yellowstone Lake. And of course, one of the most special things about being in this uh, subalpine tundra land are the wildflower seasons. Um, Yellowstone is actually known for its wildflowers. Um, Mid-June to mid-July is really the height of our wildflowers. They don't get very big up here on these high 10,000 foot peaks. Um, but we have so many different species and it is just a riot of color. This is the official park flower for gentian. Um, all different species, different times of the year, many of which are food. Um, something like the sago lily is an important indigenous food source as well as bears will eat a number of these. I love those elephant heads. Um, they, they just look exactly like that when you get down nose to nose with them. 
and some more common species that you might have in your own yard, lupin, bitterroot, Montana state flower, uh, kind of a high desert plant. Uh, just anywhere that you go, I think paintbrushes are my very favorite, just a, a riot of color uh, across the Yellowstone Plateau there in the middle of summer. Okay, so we are going to jump back on that grand loop. So we're coming back in from the east road, uh, away from the east entrance. We're going to head north at the Lake Village uh, Junction into Hayden Valley, which is a wide open plain, not very common in Yellowstone. Like I said, most of Yellowstone is, is forested. And so this is a great place to look for wildlife, particularly bison. Um, we have about 4,000 bison across the plateau, not counting this year's calves. And um, anywhere that you go, you can get in a bison jam. These big old bulls are usually on their own. They get together about once a year, take care of some business. Um, very resilient animals, super well adapted for this landscape. That is North America's largest mammal. And it is a matriarchal society. So if you see a, a group of them, that's usually the mamas and the babies. And like I said, they get together about once a year. You'll see this behavior in August during the bison rut where a bison uh, male will pee into a wallow and then roll around in it and jump up and start bellowing and uh, making some noise. The Yellowstone dating scene. Attractive, huh? <laughs> August is a great time of year. Um, about nine months later, this little calf um, caught it just after it dropped um, the next generation of bison. And they get large and playful really quickly. And by the end of their first year, if they survive, um, then they will be counted into the next year's uh, population. Great architects, landscape architects, these bison. Um, there's a lot of uh, understanding now about how much they affect the landscape. Not only do they follow the green up in the spring up our mountains, but we think they actually create the green up. It's a great recycling program. They take a bite, take a step, eat, poop, fertilizing. They are cloven hooved, so they till the earth as they walk. Um, their wallows act as water catchment tanks. Um, it's really, uh, just extremely well adapted for this North American landscape um, and super resilient in the winter. In fact, that big noticeable hump is uh, their bone structure that helps support their muscle, that helps support their head, which works like a big giant snow plow, swinging back and forth to push the snow away and get down to the grass below. So there's the Yellowstone River, wide, calm, placid river as we're traveling north along uh, the same flow of the Yellowstone, but just a little bit north of Hayden Valley. It takes a dramatic turn and starts diving in a series of waterfalls, the first of the very creatively named Upper Falls, 109 feet. And take a look at the rock around the Upper Falls. That's one of those lava flows. And again, we're right on the perimeter of the caldera boundary, again, kind of on the northeast side. And just around the corner, it carves even deeper into the lower falls of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, 308 feet. That's almost twice the size of Niagara. And into an incredibly colorful canyon, also rhyolite, that same lava flow that I mentioned earlier. Um, but basically, we're looking into the guts of an old geyser basin. So when you dump hot water in the form of these hot springs into rhyolite, it cooks it and weakens it. And that's what allowed the Yellowstone River to carve straight down uh, about, a, uh, about 1,500 feet deep in this spot, about 4,000 feet wide and any time of the year, um, including in winter when part of the falls will freeze over and create that huge ice cone in front of the falls. That'll last on a good year into uh, into May, even um, I've seen it some years there in early June. That's standing right at the brink of the falls. Uh, the Yellowstone River is an incredibly powerful river. We saw that in spades this year when it flooded communities downstream. Um, it's uh, not uh, not to be trifled with um, the power of water and what magic it can lend 
on the landscape. The Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone would be its own national park somewhere else, but it's uh, just one of the features in a land of wonder. So let's take a quick spin over to the geyser basins. Um, I could spend just an hour talking about the thermal features. Again, kind of the four coals, what's helping to release some of the heat and pressure. Um, and you'll hear people say like, hey, you've seen one geyser, you've seen them all. Not true. Um, there's about 10,000 thermal features in Yellowstone. Fumaroles are kind of the baby of the group. So it's got hot water, a hole in the ground, the water's coming up. Uh, but basically what we're seeing and hearing here is just steam, kind of like a tea kettle where the water boils away before we see it. And we're just seeing the steam and gases that are coming out of a fumarole or a steam vent. Now, if you bring enough water up to the surface and you have an open system, an open plumbing system, then what we have is water flowing out and coming up underneath. That is a hot spring. This is one of my favorites, Sapphire Pool. When you see that brilliant blue, it's really hot. It's at least 167 degrees Fahrenheit because no bacteria, no thermophiles can grow in water that hot, no visible bacteria anyway. Um, so something like Sapphire Pool is really hot. Once the water cools down, then we have this incredible riot of life. You could have two types of bacteria living in Yellowstone's hot springs, right next to each other, similar pH, similar temperatures, whose DNA is more different from each other than we are from trees. So an incredible amount of diversity. You're seeing kind of a greenish cast and that comes from that hottest color of the cyanobacteria, sort of a pale yellow with blue water on it. The blue in Sapphire Pool is nothing particularly special. It's the same reason why a swimming pool that's painted white looks appears blue, just absorbing all of the other visible colors in the spectrum. Um, and then once the water cools down, you start moving into these oranges and browns and greens. The science that comes out of Yellowstone's hot springs is literally endless. Um, every time we look, we find a new creature that's never been documented on earth. Um, we have things like, uh, how many of us have gotten COVID tested, right? The, the PCR tests that you know about. That technology came out of Yellowstone's hot springs. Uh, back in the 60s, a guy named Dr. Thomas Brock discovered a, a little creature, an organism called Thermus aquaticus. Uh, about 20 years later, a Swiss pharmaceutical company was looking for a heat stable enzyme, extracted TAC polymerase out of Thermus aquaticus. When you mix TAC with DNA, it replicates it. That that changed how we do business as humans. That was a huge impact on pharmaceuticals, medicine. Now, back when my husband was doing his work, it would take weeks to do the TAC polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Now you can buy a pocket kit and do it in 10 minutes, which we know, right? A lot of us have done the home COVID tests. Uh, if you're watching a crime show uh, on TV and they find a little spot of blood, um, that technology um, to figure out who done it came out of Yellowstone's hot springs. And we might have cures for the common cold in this bacteria. Um, the, the science behind this is literally endless. Um, microbiotics, the smaller we look, the more of the universe opens up to our eyes. Um, speaking of which, um, interesting, if you can see kind of that texture, sort of a coral looking texture, that's the way that the silica, which is the mineral that the hot springs are made out of. So remember those rhyolite lava flows, you've got water flowing up and dissolving some of that silica through the lava flows, depositing it here at the surface. And the way that the mineral builds up in the presence of this life of these microbiotics creates a certain biosignature that NASA has studied because we know there was water on Mars. And so when they sent their rovers over there, or Perseverance, say, trucking around on the surface of Mars, they're looking for rock that looks like this because this could denote the presence of life. These bacterial mats are literally the primordial slime. Um, early Earth would have been super toxic. And then all of a sudden, very quickly, we had this oxygen revolution where we had an oxygen rich atmosphere. And that this is what did it. These, um, these, uh, the cyanobacteria began to colonize. It's photosynthetic. Its byproduct is oxygen. And that's what gave Earth its oxygen-rich atmosphere. 
Grand Prismatic Hot Spring. Many of you have seen photographs. Of course, the best view is uh, elevated view. You can see a bison there for a sense of perspective. Uh, the third largest hot spring on earth. Um, so we've got fumaroles and hot springs, and then we have the mud pots, which are my favorite. This one I threw in because it's October and it looks spooky, doesn't it? Doesn't that look like the scream? <laughs> you never know what you're going to get when you um, when you take pictures of mud pots. Um, they are very dynamic, still all of the same ingredients. You've got the heat from the magma plume. You've got the, the water coming up from underneath. That fell as rain or snow, which just takes some time. Um, when we've looked at Old Faithful's water, it's about 500 years old that it fell as rain or snow. Um, and then it percolates up, dissolving some of the silica. Now, mud pots are a little bit different. They have more acid, and there are actually living creatures in here. Um, the uh, the These uh, acid-loving uh, sulfalobus bacterium eat elemental sulfur. Their byproduct is sulfuric acid, so you don't end up with a nice hard shell like you saw on some of those earlier hot springs like Sapphire Pool. Instead, it's kind of this goopy mess. It looks like it's boiling, not actually boiling, it's just gas vents. When I have the kids along, we talk about big giant earth farts here. Characters though. Um, and then geysers, and geysers are a little bit different. Um, all the same ingredients, the, the plumbing system, the, um, the heat, the water, um, but a tighter plumbing system. So if you have a hole in the ground that goes down towards that heat source, you have a constriction, like throwing your thumb over a garden hose, and then you get this eruption. Now that's Old Faithful in the distance. Beehive in the foreground, is a cone type geyser. And just look to the left there and you'll see um, indicator, which is an indication of beehive getting ready to go. That indicator geyser is just sort of spewing out. It never goes very high, maybe 15 feet or so. Um, beehive geyser, when it goes though, can get up to 150 or even 200 feet. It is literally like a fire hose and powerful. Um, here, Again, you see that silica build up uh, those deposits very slow, like maybe about the thickness of your fingernail every year, depending on the rate of flow. But in those bacterial uh, along the silica, there's uh, some tracks, some coyote and wolf tracks there. Uh, that's obviously in cool enough water that they wouldn't have burned themselves as they walked through. Um, sometimes we get that silica build up to dramatic proportions. Castle geyser, so named because it looks like the ruins of an old castle. Um, probably one of the oldest geysers um, in the world, and certainly in Yellowstone, we think that's been erupting at least since the end of the last ice age. Lone Star geyser, similar situation. And I love my rainbows. Um, you get the right angle on a geyser, an eruption with the sun at your back. And uh, as magical as this landscape is, it, it just even lends itself to that much more riverside geyser that erupts over the Firehole River. There's a sawmill, um, which had gone inactive for a few years and then kicked back up. And you can see the Old Faithful in there in the distance. And uh, just to get a sense of the scale, the power of an erupting geyser, this is fountain geyser, uh, a fountain type geyser. So just a big hole on it doesn't have the constriction at the surface. So it's just erupting out in all directions. One of my favorites. It's my daughter there that you can hear. Jet geyser behind us erupting at the same time. I know, it's perfect. This is in the Lower Geyser Basin, so a few miles uh, north of Old Faithful at the uh, Fountain Paint Pots, one of my favorite areas in the park. And of course, Old Faithful itself, and that's mostly what it looks like, just kind of steaming, and, and it's an incredible clock about every hour and a half, and there's a, actually a formula, it will erupt uh, about 8,000 gallons of water on average per eruption. 
Um, very sick, like my favorite time of year in Yellowstone is in the dead of winter. My friend Lisa took this picture um, at negative 25 degrees. So that intersection of heat and water creates some really magical landscapes. Um, the Old Faithful Inn is closed in the winter, um, but if you are ever in Yellowstone, I highly recommend, um, if you can, and it books up about a year in advance, but staying in the Old Faithful Inn, um, it's an enormous building. Uh, take a look at the, the asymmetry. Now, Robert Reamer, I mentioned him earlier, he designed this in to blend into the landscape. And when you walk in, it's like walking through the forest. And so the asymmetry of the windows creates uh, shafts of light that feel like you're walking through the forest. We're looking up at the tree house, um, not accessible to the public these days, um, just with our visitation, um, but such an interesting building full of nuance and details, uh, about 500 tons of rhyolite rock there in the center, creating the still functioning land uh, fireplace, um, beetle trails along the wood that adorns the seven stories, three accessible stories of the Old Faithful Inn. Um, some original details like the clock that was built by a blacksmith back in uh, 1903, over the winter of 1903-04. Um, and because we know people, we're going to take a quick run up to the top of the Old Faithful Inn, look down upon the lobby and take down the flags with the bellhop. Great view of the Old Faithful area. Maybe have a drink in the bear pit, listen to my friend Martha Colby on her cello or piano with drink in hand in the evening. Um, unlike any other hotel that you will stay in, a very unique and precious building, uh, the Old Faithful Inn. If you do have the luck to stay there at night, um, anywhere in Yellowstone, make sure you take a walk out. Oh, our night skies are unrivaled. Um, even, even in the developed areas, just walk away from the buildings for a quick second and you will find uh, magic, the heavens at your feet. Um, okay, we're gonna continue north and thanks for keeping up with me on this fast pace. It's hard to know what to take out because there's so much going on in Yellowstone. Again, 3,500 square miles, there are a thousand square miles just inside the bowl of the volcano. Um, but we're gonna go up, you see where it says Madison. Um, we're gonna shoot north along that road system and hit a few sites along the way, including Gibbon Falls, another one of our hundreds of waterfalls. And a quick stop at Obsidian Cliff, um, not just because it's interesting, it's an old lava flow similar to the rhyolite, but it cooled down very quickly and created that volcanic glass. I wanna take a second to mark this location though, because we have found obsidian from this exact cliff, not just in Yellowstone, but as far away as Ohio and Georgia and in your neighborhood, if you're in uh, Adams County, um, as far away as the East Coast, evidence of trade networks. This is some really high grade obsidian. Um, that spear point on the right is an old, the one with my hand is an old Clovis spear point. That, by the way, would have been, uh, whoever was using that spear point would have been hunting things like woolly mammoths. So um, a lot of history in Yellowstone that unfortunately um, has been uh, for the last 150 years, we're in our 150th year anniversary of the park's inception. And the tale of the native people has been largely obliterated. Um, we used to talk and we do still about the one group that we know that lived in the area, at least seasonally, the sheep eater or the tukudika. They would use every part of the sheep, the same thing that you've heard about bison for clothing and tools and, and shelter. Uh, the Tukudika, uh, an Eastern Shoshone mountain band would use from a bighorn sheep. So take a look at those horns. And um, this is from our National Park Service archives. They would soak those horns in hot spring water and then bend them with a, a tongue and groove to create these incredible bows that I've been told are, you know, you can't buy something as good as this in, in Cabela's. Um, and then of course the obsidian lithic resources. Um, that you'll find across the landscape. Um, but for a lot of Yellowstone's history and, and a lot of our national park history, it was sort of relegated to dusty history books and a lot of inaccurate information. And I am here to tell you that these people are still 
here. We have 49 tribes that are associated with Yellowstone. They've only recently been invited to the table. This has been a very important year for that. You can see the Crow Nation, Absalica, that's their, uh, the Crow people name for themselves, the Absalica tribe that, um, of which Yellowstone used to be part of reservation lands back when it was 30 million people. Powwows in the area are a great way um, to get to connect with some of that culture. And we do have a number around the area, but it's also critically important to remember that these people are still here. Now, this was last year. This was the first time in 2021 that a teepee had been erected in Yellowstone in 149 years. We had a ceremony right in front of the Roosevelt Arch. You can see Park Service personnel. This was a, a very big moment of recognizing our indigenous history and culture. This year, we had Mountain Time Arts, which is a local uh, indigenous arts council, um, actually erect a teepee village inside of the park. This was taken on a virtual tour that I did on location. So this is down in the town of Gardner, looking through the arch at this village. Um, Bill Snell, who set it up, um, illuminated them in the evening. This is a very powerful moment in our history to have this presence, they've, they, you know, the restoring the presence, they've never left, um, but to be so welcoming and to include these voices is of the utmost importance. And I really think that uh, those of us that are engaged in our public lands have a role to play in that in making sure that uh, we are being inclusive in our uh, telling of the National Park history, that's National Park Mountain behind these teepees here at Madison Junction this past summer, um, where sort of the story of the National Park Genesis came from. Um, and like I said, obliterated the presence of Native people. And so I'm so proud to be a part of this time in history where we are uh, telling ourselves the true story and um, and uh, sort of revisiting some of those falsehoods that have created the narrative of our national parks and public lands. Um, elk, most common mammal in Yellowstone, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15,000 or so uh, across the park. Bull elk, of course, um, this time of year, you can hear them out there bugling. Um, earlier in the season, you would start to see their antlers growing, some of the fastest growing bone on the planet, um, two to three inches a day, or I'm sorry, two to three centimeters a day at the height of the growing season when they're in velvet, external blood vessels that are helping the bone to grow so fast. And they will drop and regrow every year. And again, with our leave no trace ethics, leave what you find. Um, and uh, these are important resources out here. Everything gets used. Um, on this antler, you can see a little animal has been gnawing away. That's their calcium source. So even though you can find a $10,000 elk antler chandelier down in Jackson Hole or Bozeman, um, we don't take things like that out of the park. And of course, those antlers are used to create the next generation. Um, elk calves dropping like crazy in the spring. Um, but uh, for about 70 years, these guys had a little bit less to worry about until... 1995, when we brought wolves back to Yellowstone. Now, again, with our leave no trace ethics and trying not to take anything out or put anything into the ecosystem, we took wolves out. And if you look over in the right side of your screen there, you can see a black wolf and those elk. If you ever see elk, ears up, paying attention, not just lounging around eating, look around. Um, that's a good way to find predators. And so it was a long process um, going back to the early 70s when the Endangered Species Act was passed. That gave some teeth to bring the gray wolf. Um, we went up to Canada and captured some of what had been native uh, species in Yellowstone. We know that for a fact. It's always been the gray wolf by species name. Um, but we brought some wolves down from Canada for a couple of years running. Um, a, a release process uh, in pens for about two and a half months before we release them into the wild. And I got here about four months after the wolves did. Um, it's been an extraordinary journey the last 28 years or so of having wolves on the landscape, watching a leaner, meaner elk herd, and absolutely 
watching a much more wild space um, be revisited. Uh, watching wolves is so much fun. It's one of the primary parts of my job. Um, I love this picture because you will see ravens without wolves, but you never see wolves without ravens. In fact, that we call them wolf wolf birds. Um, they follow the packs around, and we think the packs actually follow the ravens around too, because sometimes that's uh, aerial recognizance. They might find a carcass before the wolf does. Um, and it's so much fun watching these guys interact with each other and with other species. This was a yearling um, out in Lamar Valley. And I just, this picture cracks me up. That's probably about 4,000 pounds of, of uh, a couple of bull bison looking at this guy going like, what, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> and the wolf looked around and went, yeah, that, that's not a good idea. It turned around and walked away. Um, this is at a carcass where you'll see hawks, wolves, bears. They do interact. In this case, the bear had had its fill and the wolf was moving back into the carcass. Um, we're gonna wrap things up here in the next few minutes. But a quick stop at the Mammoth Hot Springs, which are another set of thermal features, uh, similar to some of the ones that we saw earlier, but different mineral. If you were in Yellowstone a few hundred million years ago, you would have had to have had snorkeling gear. You would have been in a shallow inland sea and eventually seashells developed. Those seashells would have fallen to the seafloor and layered in and created layers of limestone. That is what is being dissolved in the hot water and brought up to the surface and redeposited and deposited and deposited, creating these incredible stair steps of travertine. And that is how we get the Mammoth Hot Springs. So this is only about five miles from my house. And I do a lot of virtual tours up here, um, again, with the, the bacteria and the colors that you'll see different times of the year, a little bit of snow on those branches to the left, intersecting with hot water, um, just an incredibly dynamic landscape. Um, but a lot more limited access this year. Um, that's an old extinct hot spring cone. Um, also in Mammoth is the old Fort Yellowstone. So uh, it looks a lot different. This picture was from 1910. Um, back in the early days, we didn't know what a national park really was. And there was a lot of vandalism and a lot of poaching. And eventually the United States Army moved in in 1886. So the park had been established for about 18 years or so at that point, um, to restore order. Um, eventually, the National Park Service was created. So Yellowstone National Park is actually older than the National Park Service. Um, and those green and gray uniforms are a nod to our Army days. And so these buildings are now currently, most of them are still there, uh, administration for the National Park Service, the Visitor Center, and some homes. Um, so if you're uh, into the more recent human history, it's fun to wander around the old Fort Yellowstone. Um, perhaps a quick jog down to Gardner. That's the little town of Gardner, population about 900 year-round residents, surrounded by public lands and wildlife. Um, that's our K-12 through school where we have pronghorn, elk. Um, the detention for the kids is to go pick up bison patties off of the field before practice. Um, that's in the spring when it's the first uh, grass in the area to start greening up. Um, so it's an interesting place to live and full of history, uh, more recent human history, the Roosevelt Arch, which was designed to welcome railroad passengers. A lot of people think Theodore Roosevelt was the president um, who signed the bill creating Yellowstone, but that's not quite the case. It was actually Ulysses S. Grant, but uh, Roosevelt did bring a lot of attention to the national parks. So we're right up there on that north entrance. And in our last few minutes, we're gonna take a journey along that northern route uh, out towards our northeast entrance into a really special area called the Northern Tier or the Northern Range. And maybe a quick stop up at Tower Falls with the overhanging basalt cliffs. Um, I mentioned rhyolite lava flows, obsidian, which is a type of rhyolite lava flow. And then we also have basalt. So as you might guess, most of our rock is ig igneous. Um, that's me towing my daughter probably, gosh, eight years ago or so now. She skis on her own these days um, along what is a ski trail in the winter. Um, but you can drive straight over to Tower Falls. Again, one of our uh, magnificent waterfalls, uh, hundreds of them all around the park, many in the backcountry. 
uh, not just on the roadside. And then I wanted to take us out to Lamar Valley. I have been missing Lamar Valley with our big floods that occurred in June. Um, much of the road washed away. And so Lamar Valley has been inaccessible. Um, I like to think of the wildlife out there getting a break from the traffic and it's all good. This landscape will endure long beyond our roads and, and vehicles and, and our management decisions at the moment. Um, but Lamar is a really special place. Um, you can take a telescope and find grizzly bears, wolves, pronghorn, marmots, um, badgers, uh, even a wolverine perhaps, um, all in one, uh, one view. It's a really incredibly dynamic landscape. Hundreds of bison, elk, bighorn sheep, uh, ever-changing, um, uh, different times of the year, different uh, sets of light. And, you know, for as much as we've walked through, it's these big open spaces that I think are uh, some of the most important aspects of having a place like Yellowstone, a place where grizzly bears can roam, a place where if you pause to listen, You might hear some wolves howling. Literally the call of the wild. I hope that for any of you that you um, find time and space in your life to hear wolves howling. It was absent from Yellowstone for about 70 years. And the fact that we had the political wherewithal and the public support to be able to restore uh, something like wolves to the ecosystem and bring our full complement, uh, a missing component. And, and we could talk about that for an hour alone. Um, Aldo Leopold had a quote that said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity stability and beauty of the biotic community, it is wrong when it tends otherwise. And I believe that's a really important tenant to remember, not just with our public lands, but just in daily life. Um, a few other species you might find, pronghorn, um, including the new generation, fastest land mammal in North America, uh, second fastest in the world next to the uh, cheetah. Um, and I just love the babies, but um, bighorn sheep, we saw some males earlier. Um, here's a, a, a ewe with a lamb. Moose, we do have moose across the park, not, not as many as bison or elk, but a handful. Um, coyote, the omnipresent coyote. I know just about anybody listening or watching right now probably has coyotes in their neighborhood. Uh, resilient creatures that they are hunting here in the winter. Red fox, um, another very resilient character, especially in the winter, listening and uh, listening for one of those little subnivian or uh, under snow dwellers. Um, we do have cats. We've got three types of cats, not very common for any of them. Bobcats are a little more common. Um, we do have mountain lions. I've seen maybe 10 in my, all of my years here. We do have lynx. I've never seen one of those just uh, occasionally passing through. Um, and then, of course, our smaller animals, things like marmots and red squirrels chattering at you from the trees. Um, so sometimes it's not just what we call the charismatic megafauna, but this little guy, I was out skiing and saw this dark spot on the snow a couple of probably, you know, 50 feet away and kept getting closer. And what is it? You never see them. Uh, pocket gopher, they live below the, uh, they live down in the dirt and uh, under the snow in the winter, but he climbed right up on me. He must've been hungry. He started gnawing on my pant leg. Um, you can see those big diggers in that picture with my boot. Um, so all around us, just so much life. Uh, river otters, uh, five types of snakes. Um, we do have rattlesnakes, so you have to kind of watch out for those, particularly in the lower elevations. Um, bull snakes are much more common, not dangerous at all. And I love this young one. He was a juvenile um, pretending to be a rock um, eyeball. I'm sure he could see me. Uh, not, again, not dangerous at all. Lots of birds, common ones that you'd have in your own neighborhood, like mallards and Canada geese, but also 
potentially more exotic ones like trumpeter swans, um, sandhill cranes, which are um, some of my very favorite birds. They are seasonal residents. They come in and nest on those little islands, um, doing some morning yoga there. And if you listen, that chortle of call of the sandhill crane, you can hear one in the distance answering. And then eventually, again, the next generation um, of sandhill cranes. American white pelican, the largest nesting ground um, for the American white pelican, which you think of as more of like a, a coastal bird is actually in Yellowstone Lake. Um, so we certainly have, uh, uh, again, some of these large birds have about an eight foot wingspan when they fly. Um, harlequin ducks with their colorful plumage. Um, the mountain bluebird, um, always a precious sign of spring when our mountain bluebirds show up in the spring. And bald eagles, ravens, um, if you take a look, uh, those are two very common birds. If you take a look at that picture on the left, you'll see an, an immature bald eagle about three quarters of the way up the tree. And think about what might be below these birds. Uh, it's a carcass. A dead animal is always a good draw for all the things that we want to see elseways and else times. Um, but magnificent birds, the ravens, you'll see them in the parking lot talking to you, trying to beg for some food. Don't feed the wildlife. Again, with our leave no trace ethics, um, osprey out there fishing for some of our native trout and just noticing the evidence of birds that are left behind uh, occasionally that came across this hawk feather. Um, and so up in the air, um, in the thermal features around the landscape, um, Yellowstone is just full of life. Um, everywhere you look, this lichen that grows in clean air, uh, both tree lichen or rock lichen, like what we're seeing here, um, it's full of life. Um, Full of patterns. Um, I, I love taking photos of pat uh, tracks in snow um, or just even close ups of different patterns that you might notice in the natural world. Uh, this snow roller, uh, some tumbling down the hill and creating what looks like a delicious uh, edible um, patterns in our water. Um, Yellowstone is full of movement, um, sometimes just furiously fast gushing waterfalls, uh, chases with our wildlife. This did work out okay for this mule deer, um, it got away. Sometimes the movement in Yellowstone is infinitesimal and just barely noticeable watching a moon set over Electric Peak just down the road from my house. Yellowstone is old and wise. When you see these bison that are so well adapted to the landscape, that's a good reminder of that. Um, but it's also young and playful and, and dynamic in that way. Um, it can be really harsh and barren. There's a moose down there in the corner surviving a, a winter blizzard. Um, it's constantly full of color, uh, totally different time of year. It can be dizzying. Yellowstone reminds us of those elemental and important moments in our life. It's a chance to slow down. It can be full of death. Certainly the circle of life is evident all around us all the time in a wild landscape, um, but it's also full of new life. Yellowstone is endlessly vibrant. It's endlessly bright and endlessly powerful. I appreciate all of you so very much for coming on this journey. And I think I went a few minutes over. Um, Sally, if you tell me that we are um, still there, I will um, stop my screen share. Actually, one more photograph. This is my favorite time of year, is the dead of winter and the dead of calm. That's Mammoth Village. Um, that's my information. I do want to take some questions, um, but if I don't get around to answering a question, 
feel free to follow up with an email. Um, I love connecting with participants and people that are interested and curious about our public lands and Yellowstone in particular. Um, it's, a, it's a precious backyard, but I'd love to um, connect with any of you that would like to afterwards as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ashia. That was fascinating and beautiful. Um, I think we do have a couple questions here. Um, Amy asks, can the upper and lower falls be seen from the road or is a hike required? Nope, fully accessible, um, including uh, for all, all abilities. Uh, you park in a parking lot, a short walk to either, and there's a number of viewpoints for the lower falls. Uh, a couple of viewpoints for the upper falls, but very, very easily accessed on the Grand Loop Road. Great. Uh, Janelle asks, did the railroad tracks <clears throat> go through the arch or was the arch just to look at as you rode by? That's a great question. Nope, they came right up to it. Um, not actually through the arch itself. Um, in fact, that arch is a little bit incongruous because it's this large man-made structure uh, to some extent, and it was part of that railroad philosophy, um, there was an idea of wanting um, a, an appropriate entrance, you know, a strong statement on the landscape. We probably wouldn't build it these days because it's not a very natural part of the setting, even though it does use native basalt. Um, and so the railroad tracks came right up basically in front of it, what is now Arch Park. Um, the old depot building is our little library, actually, um, in Gardner. Um, and then the school. So those photos of the school with the wildlife on the field, that's just right beyond it. So um, the turnaround was right there. And the, the railroad made it to Gardner, near Gardner, by 1886, but not right up to Arch, what is now Arch Park until 1903. Okay. Um, there's another question. Are there any wild horses or burrows in Yellowstone? Great question. No, not inside of Yellowstone. Um, there are nearby though. So if you go out the east side through Cody, Wyoming and down into the Bighorn Basin, there are some wild horses down there, uh, down in the Pryor Mountains, for instance. Um, and I know there's some, uh, I think that's the closest place. So still right on the edge of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, they would have been uh, originally from, although we did have a, a genus of horse way back, like Pleistocene, um, but uh, mostly wild horses that were um, just uh, over the years when the Spaniards brought horses onto the continent. Um, so no, not right inside of Yellowstone, but nearby. I actually have a question for you. Um, in uh, Mr. Knighton's book, he talks about some of the national parks having um, problems with crowding and the destruction that is happening. Um, so when I think about why well, I'd love to see these things, I think, is it going to ruin, you know, ruin these wild places? What are your thoughts and on that? That's a really great question, Sally. Um, we are struggling with overvisitation. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of been an interesting year in terms of the economic pressure on the park to open up access again. Um, you know, a lot of people make their living on running outfits in the park or restaurants adjacent to the park or, um, for instance, guiding companies of which I'm a part of that community. Um, and so uh, our visitation just in my years has not quite doubled, but we've gone from just under 3 million to over 5 million. Um, because of the limits on access through the North Gate, this is the first year that I've been able to tour to Old Faithful in several years because it was just not tenable to make that drive. It's only 50 miles, but it could take us hours, literally to drive from Mammoth or Gardner to Old Faithful. So that tells us that there are a lot of people and it is harder to find those quiet spaces. It's always accessible depending on how easily you can get off the road. You know, you can walk off the road and find those quiet places. Um, but a lot of social trails, a lot of resource damage from the crowds. And so, you know, this is what we grapple with though, because in order to be relevant, our public lands have to have visitation, right? We have to, you know, if a child never has an experience with a wild animal and they only ever see wildlife in a zoo, um, or a domestic situation, 
then why would they care about saving it? You know, if you never have an experience on the edge of a wild running river, fishing for trout or just sitting in a meadow, listening to wolves howl, then, then, you know, maybe you don't have the wherewithal to purchase with those wild places in mind or make decisions on purchasing with those wild places in mind. So we need visitation to keep relevant. Where are the limits? And so this is a constant conversation right now. Um, I think the most important component to that, and because I would never discourage anyone from visiting our national uh, parks or our public lands, is to come educated. You know, do a little bit of research, read books like um, Leave Only Footprints, you know, take a look at, uh, hire a local guide, you know, somebody who's going to go into that space with a mindfulness and with Leave No Trace Ethics. If that's not in your budget, Take a little bit of time to read some guidebooks and know what you're getting into, what times a day, how to avoid the heavy crowds, and how to be a good steward of these lands. Um, leave no, I can't say leave no trace ethics enough um, guiding principles on, on being in these public spaces. Ed asks, if you had to choose one season to visit, which one? Oh, that's a great question. For me, um, I would say the dead of winter. I, I love Yellowstone in winter. It's quieter. Uh, it's a, you know, a lot more quiet, um, but it's also difficult to get to. It's a lot more expensive. You can't just drive your car. You have to be in a snow coach or a snowmobile to be able to access places like Old Faithful. Um, you can drive in your own vehicle out as far as Lamar Valley, um, Cook City, outside the Northeast entrance. But it, uh, you know the majority of the park is under snow and snow vehicles only. Um, so it's a, a lot more effort to get down there uh, into the interior, um, but it's a really special time of year. Um, spring is wonderful and spring comes late, you know, so we're talking May, late May, even early June. It's a great time for babies, um, chicks and pups and lambs and kids and cubs and pups and all the things um, running around the landscape. That's a really special time of year. Um, and I would say right now, you know, this is, um, you know, it's hit or miss. We'll start to see our first snow any day. Um, but in fact, we've got snow on the high peaks, um, but it's, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a quieter time. The nights are cool. The wildlife gets, uh, you know, reactive a, a little bit longer because we've got these longer nights. Um, I would say that there's not a bad time to come to Yellowstone, that there's something special about every day of the calendar year. Um, and it's just a matter of finding those, you know, what your priorities are. Uh, and another question from Joanne, would you, would love you to come back and tell us more about the introduction of wolves to the park? Yeah, um, I'd love to, um, you know, keep in touch with Sally and <laughs> keep in touch with your administrative staff. And I'd love to do a talk just on wolves alone. We could spend easily an hour or two discussing that and uh, what it's been like to have wolves gone, you know, not just continuously, but gone for 70 years and what has happened ecologically, politically. Um, you know, we just came out of a really interesting year where the um, governor of Montana and the uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks uh, basically said we aren't going to have a limit on wolves in uh, in Montana. And so about 20 percent, almost a quarter of Yellowstone's wolves got shot last year, um, which had a huge impact on um particular packs on pack dynamics, on interactions with how, you know, we have wolves walking around in downtown Gardner, which isn't great, but all of a sudden we had these parentless wolves that were just like, oh, what do we do? And, you know, so those reper those political decisions repercussing ecologically, um, yeah, fascinating, um, great books out there. I've, I've been so privileged to be a part of that process for all of this time. So yeah, get in touch if you like, and I can send you some resources or we can do it again. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, Jess, are there any more questions that you're seeing? No, I am not seeing any more questions. Okay, well, I guess if there are no more questions, um, we will sign off for the evening. I just wanna say that that was fascinating and we really appreciate you coming out and sharing um, the fantastic um, wildlife and sites of Yellowstone. And I 
personally can't wait to go visit again. <laughs> Stay in touch. I would love, I would love to host you. Um, and I, and I just really appreciate um, everyone, readers and um, people engaging with public lands in whatever form or fashion that is, even if it's, um, you know, being curious enough to, to read uh, some insights from authors. Um, I, like I said earlier, it's a real honor and I appreciate it. I know we covered a lot of ground. Um, and so if there are questions and certainly feel free to send feedback back to our administrative, administrative staff, I'd be happy to take any feedback. Um, and, uh, if, and when our participants can get to Yellowstone, please connect, um, feel free to email me again, just info at yellowstone.education. Education is all spelled out, um, all one word. And I would um, love to be able to answer questions that might come up for folks later in the day once you've had a chance to sit and, and process and think about some of the things that we discussed. Um, it's a, a huge and dynamic and complicated and old park. And so um, I really genuinely appreciate everyone for joining in today. Thank you so much. And we will make sure to put um, the contact information for Ashia uh, with the YouTube video as well. So Great. thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us and have a wonderful evening. And thanks again, Ashia. Thank you.